Syria is a very ancient and beautiful country. It's called the cradle of civilization. But we have been living under dictatorship for 40 years. But we were so optimistic that the revolution will sooner or later start in Syria. They wrote, it's your turn, doctor, because Bashar al-Assad was trained as a doctor. But anyone who talk about him, he will just disappear or he will die. It was horrible. It started the revolution all over Syria. More than half a million people joined the demonstrations. Our job is to save their life through destroying the terrorists. We demonstrated holding roses, and he called us terrorists. This regime, they are supposed to protect us, but they are not protecting us. They are shooting us. وصل لمرحلة إنه خلاص شارف على السقوط يعني ما عاد عنده قدرة يحمي أي منطقة من المناطق هون الطرية استعين بميليشيا طائفية عابرة للحدود. When the Russians got involved, things are getting worse every day. قالت إنه رح تحارب داعش وهي كذبة كبيرة يمكن أكبر كذبة بتاريخ البشرية. We Syrians are the people who are suffering the most from ISIS. There is a group of people who give us hope, a group who are trying to save lives. We are not terrorists. We are people like everyone in this world. And we still have dreams. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, have a see you guys. I, I, I want to say before I even get started in this interview, I've watched a number of documentaries about the subject. Uh, and I've done interviews about them, and I want to say that this, uh, this one I would recommend is the most essential viewing. If you care, which you should, and if you are interested in the entire story, what has happened and what is happening in Syria, it's an, it's an unbelievable achievement how you've put all of this together. Congratulations, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Well, I want to start with the question of, as a filmmaker, obviously you did this in your, in your documentary about Ukraine, which is that you told a story that is somewhat fluid, that is still happening as you're shooting, as you're putting the story together, and even as you're releasing it, new news is coming out, new strategies are being created, and new alliances are, are maybe, you know, alliances are being withheld still. What is it like making a documentary like that, telling a story like that that's still fluid, that as we sit here and you're doing press for it, the story is evolving? I think, first of all, following the refugees and uh, what I did immediately after Winter on Fire, you know what, I was trying to understand why we, in 21st century, kind of getting all these huge waves of refugees in the European Union, and why the world all of a sudden uncovering something that we not experienced since Second World War. And the answer was to go back into the history and reconstruct. And if you're talking about filmmaking process, I think every filmmaker knows that to tell the story, you need to have beginning, middle, and end. And we were some kind of in the middle, but you're missing this beginning of the story. So my realization was, in order to answer the question, you need to go back into the history and reconstruct it. So that's why I went back to the Syrian border, back to the history, and tried to find people like Hulud, who was from the beginning of the uprising. I tried to find the icons of the revolution, like Abdel Basit Sarud, or Hadi Abdullah, or even discover the kids that originally wrote this graffiti on the walls of the school of Dera, from whom the revolution started. And we actually found five kids, one in Austria, and uh, one in Jordan, and another three, they, they went back from Jordan to Syria. So this was the journey to uncover things and basically to reconstruct the history. And then this helps you to understand why it's happened, how it's happened, and what brought from the uprising 
into the civil war, from civil war into the interventions, and to our days. So, and as a co consequences, what's happening is the refugee waves. The people flee in the country. The, the people flee in the country because they are seeking shelter, because their choice in Syria is to die in the prisons from the torture or from the horrible abuse to die under the bombing and shelling what's happening these days in Aleppo, or in the, no longer in Aleppo, in Idlib right now, or to die from the chemical weapon, and somehow media not covering, like you said, it is developing still. Last week, it was again, used of chemical weapon in Idlib, and a lot of kids suffered. No media was covering this. So there is a lot of atrocities that still happening, and only the choice for these people is to flee and find shelter. So all this was kind of compactly put it in a comprehensive story in this movie versus the small new segments that we kind of, as the world, were exposed since 2015. Incredibly comprehensive. I, I will say also when it comes to this film, and if you can look at footage of Aleppo or any of the cities that have been bombed and devastated the way that they have and not have a more humane ideology when it comes to the refugee crisis, I have no words for you. Because what Syrians have gone through in the last five years is heartbreaking to say the least. It's heartbreaking to say the least. And I'm curious, you know, you want to create a comprehensive history about how the, how it got to this point, what's happening right now. How difficult is that in, in, in a situation where there's been lots of misinformation and the government tries to shield people from information as much as possible? Is that difficult or do you know exactly where you're going to get the sort of true factual information? I think, first of all, my main goal was to find the people who witnessed that the people who been in the middle of these events and through their voices tell the story because they're the true witness, they're the truer people who been there, who can have the first-hand account, like Khulud, like uh, Abdel Basit, like Hadi, like these kids from the Ra who've been uh, basically tortured and some of their friends were killed, some other amazing kids who've been on a different uh, uh, segments of these events. So for me, it was very important to slowly, slowly through these two years, first of all, to find the real characters who've been in during these events, and secondary, to find all bits and pieces of footage that were surrounding these events. And this, of course, helped me to reconstruct the history. And you know what? We ended with 20 terabytes of footage, and I had almost uh, over 100 interviews that I conducted across the entire Middle East and European Union and some Syria. So that was uh, our goal, and that's what we did. Khalid, uh, when, when did you meet him and what were your first thoughts when you were approached to be interviewed for, for, for this series? I, I know you, you run a, uh, we didn't mention it when we introduced you, but you, you sort of, you run a newspaper out, out of Syria, correct? Yeah. Uh, we met, it was May 2015. Uh, some friends connected us together, so he was introduced to the newspaper and through the newspaper he was connected with me and other Syrian activists. Uh, why I took this decision? Because um, when I give it a thought, for five years we've been reporting on a daily basis, and we've we've been subject to all the atrocities and the the massacres and the trauma um, that happened for five years, to the extent that sometimes I forget the details, and sometimes I forget, for example, what happened last year. And I took the decision to participate because it tells my story and goes back to the, to the days where we started demonstrating in the streets, things that now it's not forgotten, but there is no time to remember them because there are other atrocities to remember and take care of. You know, you say at one point in the documentary, and it's such a, a powerful statement of yours, you say after the chemical weapons, Assad released chemical weapons on, uh, on civilians, or on children, you say you thought at that point the universe would open up and, and stop him, which is an unbelievable thing to say that it gets so bad that you would think a miracle of God or of somewhere else would just stop him. How do you go on after that? How do you, how do you retain hope and, 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 and continue forward when the universe doesn't do that? It's my friends whom I lost. And we were together in 2011, hand in hand in the streets, calling for freedom. And it's the, the, our friends who are detained in prisons. For them, I keep, I keep going. And for them, I keep 
breathing and fighting for our words to be listened and heard. Otherwise, I lose all, all, all of them. Like their blood will go for nothing. And I don't want this to, to happen. Um, I was once asked about what keeps me going on or why I continue. I'll be a big liar if I say that I will not be, um, like it will not stop me. I stopped several times. The whole newspaper stopped for two weeks from publishing or reporting things only because we were reporting massacres and people who have been killed in the streets and these people are my people, like my, ha my t townsmen and women. So what the benefit to, 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 to report all these atrocities to the world? And no one is listening to us, but it goes no longer than two or three weeks, and then we continue. Has it, any, has it at any point felt like the world has started listening? Not yet. Not yet. At a certain point when the conversation about what was happening in Syria at least came to the United States, it seemed to at first become a conversation about humanitarian aid and very quickly turned into what felt like political football. Yeah. And the actual human lives that were, being, that were being lost and were in jeopardy was immediately lost in the conversation. Was that something that was noticed or felt by Syrians as well? Of course, like whenever somebody tackles the Syrian cause, it's tackled as a humanitarian issue. It's not a humanitarian issue. Like if, if somebody interfered with this, I'll be home and I will not be a refugee now. And the bloodshed will be stopped like let's say three or four years ago, but no one interfered. And they changed this issue from a political issue to a humanitarian issue. And now they are struggling with the refugees, the IDPs, and uh, the hundreds and thousands and millions of us uh, scattered in this universe and they don't know what to do with us stop the bloodshed, stop the killing, and everybody will go back home and just have an end to what is made a humanitarian issue will be the best solution. A lot of, uh, a lot of people is not the best sort of preface for a question, but uh, since the bombing of Aleppo and since Assad was able to take Aleppo at one point, a lot of people have said that the Syrian people are tired and they would go home to an Assad-backed regime at this point. Do you, think that that's, do you think that that's true? Obviously, you can't speak for everybody. Yeah, of course. Like, it happened with some people, those who were entrapped in Aleppo for four years, and some people were entrapped for six years with no food, no nothing and with a daily, like, daily shelling, and they lost all their families. So their only solution is they don't want to leave the country, and the only solution is to go back to the regime-controlled areas and to stay there. They know that it's so dangerous. Most of them disappeared, disappeared completely. No one knows where are they now. Because it's not as if you're gonna go back and the Assad regime is gonna welcome everybody no. with open arms and, and rebuild. He's gonna look for any sort of dissent yeah. amongst the people that return and, and try to root it out. And the game that the Assad plays is that when they take new lands from, from the opposition, they go to the media and say that we welcome the Syrians, these are the civilians, these are our people, go back home, go back to your country, go back to your original place, and it goes for the media for two or three weeks, and out of a sudden people disappear. And no one knows where are they, and no one can follow up with them. And he says, well, we're, we have to get the terrorists out. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like when you're, when you're telling this story, just the idea that within a couple years of war, a sort of vulnerable country can turn into a sort of a proxy war for several different countries and factions at the same time? How did you, what was it like covering that? Because that's a really difficult story to tell. There's so many people involved now. But you see, my focus not was on the proxy war. My, my focus not was on the political side. My focus was on the people. I wanted to tell their story from the beginning till the end, till our days. Our last shot, actually, of the movie was done in December, actually, last year. So we literally tried to keep everything up to date. And I will tell you more than that. I think one of the reasons why I wanted to tell this specific story, we as the world, or we as the Western civilization, or Western human beings, we not were aware of what happened there prior. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to bring knowledge to us, because like you said, 
we, we barely were talking about that. And only when we, this subject came to United States 2015, something, then we were looking at the refugee crisis, but nobody was talking about how it's happened. So I think for me, we as the Western civilization, we're lack of knowledge because we not were ignoring them or abandoning them. When I met first time all these people there on the borders or in Europe, they were like, oh, all worlds abandoned them. And they were thinking that we are abandoning them, but it's wrong expression. I try to show them that no, we're not abandoning you. We're just lack of knowledge. And this knowledge I was trying to put in this comprehensive story, instead of uh, all these small segments of news that were coming since 2015, since the world was exposed to the image of Ilan Kurdi, three-year-old child, September 2015, when he was found in the shores of Turkey, and then the image of Amran. Which is how you open the documentary. Yes, yeah. but uh, he's resembling for me the death of the children of Syria. He's specifically, he's like a death of the children of Syria, this lost, the lost generation of kids. And then Amran's image that everybody were observing on CNN and all other outlets, 18th of August 2016. Amran was some kind of survival and struggle for me. And Amran was five years old. And then in December, I, would, I brought Bana al Abed, who was symbolizing hope. So all these three iconic images of the kids were, for the first time, brought in a context together. And through them, I tried to tell the story. So for the first time, I tried to bring this knowledge to the Western audience to understand these people, that they are not trying to take over, like it was presented a lot of times in the media, that they are not the rebels in a negative connotation. Because remember, the news and press created from the word rebels a negative connotation. But who is these rebels? It's the same people who came to protest and ask for freedom, for freedom of expression, freedom of speech, human rights in 2011. Well, as it, you show, in, in many cases, it's, the, it's people who were part of the Syrian army that, that left and formed the Free Syrian Army who were essentially protesting the brutality that was being put on, that was being asked of them by the Assad regime. Absolutely, but the Free Syrian Army was created to protect these protesters. Yeah. So it started just with the simple people like all of us. Same people that were protesting in January and February here because of our new government. So at the end of the day, it's all of us who can be, who can be on the streets right now protesting against our own government that are doing right now some unimaginable things. So at the end of the day, it's all of us who can be on the streets and then we can be called terrorists. So at the end of the day, it's the simple people who've been forced to take weapons and the army soldiers who saw that their own brothers and sisters being killed on the streets while they're protesting. So they created the Free Syrian Army to protect them. So at the end of the day, rebels are the simple people. How difficult was it for you sort of compiling a comprehensive history of what was happening, comprehensive story of what was happening, and then you turn on the news, and as you said, you see three, four-minute clips that really yields from the viewer a simple kind of like, well, I guess it's bad over there, or that's bad, you know? There's no, as you said, comprehensive story as to what is happening, why it's happening, what you can do to help, anything like that. First of all, I think it's the knowledge that, again, is also creating Winter on Fire, but Winter on Fire, I was doing on the go as follows. Here, I was reconstructing the history, and I think it was uh, another experience that I gained from my previous movies. So it's a process that I, as filmmaker, was going through. It's amazing team that I had with me, like Aaron Butler, who is an amazing editor, and with him we had the entire map of the history, and we were like uh, scene by scene creating this story. Of course, there is some um, small elements that we've not been able to include because we're talking about two hour movie and including six years of the history. But we try to kind of enlighten and bring the knowledge to the people as much as possible in these two hours and step by step to bring all chronolo chronology. Uh, in the film, you uh, talk about your brother who was uh, taken by the Assad regime. Uh, it's been three years, you said four years? Five. Five years since he was taken. Five years now. And you haven't, you still have not heard it, anything. Yeah. How often is that the story for families in Syria right now? Mm, there's no single family in Syria who has not lost a child in prisons. Uh, for me, it's my brother, it's my cousin, and my brother-in-law. And then the extended family, all, almost all my cousins are in prison. Like one is in prison. Uh, for my friends, 
two months ago, we've heard that one of my friends has been killed under torture. And for me, he was, uh, like we've been waiting for him for five years, but in the end, we've heard the news that he's dead. So it's every single Syrian family, not only me. I'm gonna ask you a very uh, simplistic question, but just for the sake of this conversation, and for the audience who may not under know, why would you say your brother or your cousin or family members are arrested? Why I say this? Why are they? Why would, why would the regime say that they're arrested? Why are they actually arrested? Because they were accused of being terrorists. My brother was taken from home while we were fast asleep. It was 12.30 a.m. And he was doing... Um, uh, he was helping the displaced people from Homs. They were the first people to be displaced. And because he was helping the refugee, uh, the IDBs at that time, the displaced people, uh, he was arrested and he was accused of being a terrorist. And at that time, we don't have free Syrian army yet. And all the people who were sent to jail, they were sentenced to, for terrorism uh, actions. Uh, I'm going to open up to the audience for some questions right here. Hi, thanks so much for being here. And I just want to thank you so much for all of your work and your courage to tell this story. It's really um, important, and we need to hear it. Um, and I was wondering, I'm sure you collected a lot of footage. Um, what was it like editing through that? 20 terabytes, you said. Uh, yeah, it is 20 terabytes. But you know what? We were working day and night because we realized that A, it is important to bring this story as quick as possible. So the main uh, phase of editing started in 5th of September. And we literally, you've been in uh, 20, around 19th, 20th of November <laughs> you came, yeah. So 11 weeks and we finished the movie. But we were working like day and night, including weekends. And uh, for us, the main goal was to bring this story to the world, to tell. So people not will be in darkness and people can learn. And you know, there is a lot of learning process, I guess, that we can apply as Americans to us because there is a lot of elements that right now appealing to all situations what happened in the United States. And there is a lot of things that we can learn about them, how to help them, and to realize who are these people. Uh, I have a question for you uh, before I turn it over to the audience one more time. Uh, we're talking, you were you, we brought up refugees and, you know, the quote unquote refugee crisis. And just yesterday, Donald Trump re-signed his travel ban, his sort of updated new and improved travel ban, which excluded Iraq from the list of countries. But Syria is still a country that is on that list. Now, the United States, since the beginning of um, the Civil War, has done very little to to help um, the people of Syria against Assad, or just in general, I think they gave a little bit of aid to the, the Free Syrian Army at one time, but what does this travel ban do in terms of how the Syrian people think of the United States right now, and how the Syrian people think the United States feels about what's happening there? Um, first of all, um, we, the Syrian people, we lost hope in all governments in the world. And frankly speaking, we don't believe in governments anymore. What brought me here to stand up in front of the people is the people themselves. Like, I, belie I believe in people. They can make the change. So they can practice a kind of pressure over the governments. Then it's going to be the public themselves practice this pressure over the governments. So they might change things. Um, we know that things will not change. But whenever something new happens, we feel like uh, we are more and more entrapped in the bottleneck and we can't breathe anymore. Um, it, it means nothing for the Syrian people to be banned from the states because we can't have access to the states, I mean, before. But it's the, a breathing place for activists if they were invited to, to stand up here in front of people to inform the people about what's going on now we're losing it more and more. Now it's getting very difficult for me to come to the States. Last time? Last, uh, last time, yesterday. You entered yesterday? Yeah. Wow. Before the ban. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get there, right there. We laugh, but it was probably an ordeal. You were probably worried that if you came in the following day, you might not, be, you might not have been able to get in, right? 
And I want to say something for myself about this ban. I think our government trying to look again, I'm maybe not talking right now as the filmmaker, but as the American citizen who deeply cares about what's happening in our country. And I think for a lot of people here, it's also important to know that I think this is the easy way how our government trying just to shut the doors in front of the people. Because at the end of the day, from the movie, you will learn who behind the ISIS, how it was born in Syria, and how Al-Qaeda was born in Syria. And I think if the government truly wants to fight the terrorism, it's not just the shut door in front of the people who are looking for the shelter. It's to do the proper diligence and to find the roots and the causes of the terrorism, how it operates, and then to do the proper steps, not just to close the doors in front of the people who are seeking shelter. Because the same kids that we closing the doors in front of them, these kids can be sheltered by the terrorists. They can be given shelter by the same ISIS or Al-Qaeda and easy brainwashed. I met so many kids that have been brainwashed. They are the mechanism, they have the mechanism to brainwash the kids. So then we creating the terrorism, but in the end, our government should more cooperate with the intelligence that somehow they are not doing these days. Donald Trump, as the president, refusing to cooperate with the intelligence. And this is the wrong approach. I think they, instead of finding the easy way, just shouting the doors, and his plans also to go into Syria and to Iraq to fight ISIS on the side of Russia. That is another stupid idea for my experience because I've been there and I saw it. I think it will be another casualties, another innocent lives will be taken. So I think the government needs to take approach of the research, of the learning process, and then properly with intelligence fighting in different ways but not just to shut the door down in front of the people who in need and say, you know what, do it on your own and uh, we just not allowing you to come in our country. It's wrong approach, it's old approach. Terrorism working in these days differently. And I learned this and you will learn it from the movie. And it's something that we, you know, the previous administration of the United States may not have been perfect at, but at the very least understood to a degree. And the hope is that some of the people who are encircling the Trump administration who have military and intelligence experience will sort of win, fa win favor in regards to, to that situation. But this travel ban is really a bad sign in regards to it. And I, I'm curious, you know, you, you, you mentioned Russia. Your last documentary was about Ukraine. Uh, just a quick question about what it's like to have worked on that documentary, been inside Ukraine, and to now have, again, a president of this country who doesn't see Ukraine as an actual issue when it comes to Russia, doesn't feel the need to get in between Russia and the Ukraine. You know what? A, my previous movie helped a lot to Ukraine, and I know previous movie helped a lot to sustain the sanctions on Russia and helped a lot to bring Ukraine on a map, international map, and people... Also, like about Syria right now, people learned a lot about Ukraine. So I hope this movie will be able also to shed the light on all the events that happened. But again, it's up to the administration to be open and learn. And my only hope, and we're planning to try to bring it to the US administration to see the movie, my only hope that they will be open, open-minded to see the movie, openly uh, ready to learn something for them. I'm not saying that they not have knowledge, but a lot of them, because they're busy in all politics inside, they may not have the knowledge what we learned while we were there. So I think they need to be open and willing to learn, and maybe few of them will be able to change something in their mind. Then we achieved already some kind of thing. And I think for every filmmaker, it's a dream to change somebody's lives. And in my situation, my hope that I can save somebody's lives. So I hope that they will be open as the parents, because the movie, mainly on the kids. It's their voices. It's the, this lost generation of the Syrians, but at the same time, it's a generation that wants to rebuild one day Syria. So I hope they are, besides their politicians, their parents. So I hope they will be able to hear these kids and to listen to their voices and maybe change something because they have this ability. And we, as the people, we, it's said in the Constitution, we are the people. So we have ability to change something in our country. And I think learning from these lessons, we can prevent our bad future. Absolutely. Next question. Hi, thank you so much for being here and sharing your stories. Um, this, your, what you just said kind of leads into my question. I don't know that there's an easy answer to this, but what do you think that Americans can do in the short term and in the long term to help? 
First of all, I think Americans need to reevaluate what we have in our hands. And I will tell you something. We sometimes taking things for granted. We forgetting that for the same freedom that they fighting since 2011, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom for expression, democracy, human rights, our founding fathers stood and gave their lives. So we, I guess, need to reevaluate our values that we having and sometimes forgetting about them. Values like simple food, because the kids that I met in my journey we are starving. You know what? I was filming, and a lot of times I was bringing food with me just to give them food. So you know what? We need to reevaluate these things. We need to get, give more respect to our even neighbors. And you know what? And then we will be able also to help them. And to help them, you know what? From go and press our government to not to do things like ban and to do more intensive research on the terrorism, for example. And we created a website that calls exactly like the movie, ChristFromSyria.com, that you all can go. And there is a lot of information, from the resources that are helping to the uh, refugees, to the specific, all the information on every government officials that you guys can call, write, reach, and ask for certain things, because they are officials that have been elected by us. They're representing us. So we can pressure on them to do some changes. We also launching our outreach to bring it to every school, to every university, because there is a lot to learn for us, because we are responsible for our future and the future of our kids. And you know what? We have right now so many changes in our country in the last two months that I, as the filmmaker who've been seeing two major revolutions in there, in, a, in Ukraine, and then their revolution, and learning. You know what, for me, I am really shocked because things that I learned there and saw there happening in my country right now, in our country. And at the end of the day, I want to prevent future to happen in the, like in my movies. So I think we have a lot of learning process from the movies, and at the same time, we need to prevent our bad future. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I feel like we didn't even really talk about this because we've just been talking about series as a whole. But as a filmmaker, you know, where where did you station yourself? Where were you going most of the time when I talk to people who have made something in Syria? It's on the border. It's you can't really get in. You're talking about bringing food to children. Where where were you shooting and what was it uh, like? I've been everywhere from the Syrian border between Kilis and Azaz, that is the Turkish Syrian border, to different places in Turkey, Rikhanli. Sunny Urfa, Gaziantep, Istanbul, then Lebanon, Beirut, uh, Mount Lebanon, Beka Valley on the border uh, between Syria and Lebanon, uh, Jordan, uh, Amman. I've been on the Jordanian border with Syria. I've been. Uh, in Greece, I've been in. Uh, well, what was it like? What I mean, what was it like traveling inside Syria while shooting? I, I've been only on the border, the border, just through yeah. the border. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I can't go deeply far. A, just across the border, you technically need to pay, like they're paying. And it's another thing that I will tell you, something what I learned. Mostly people who had money left the Syria. The people who not had money, they are still in Syria. Because just to leave Syria, you need to pay smugglers, one way or another. It's the smugglers who are able to bring you through the borders. The officially, you can't cross the border. Khalid, are you, are you still in Syria right now? Are you no, I left Syria in 2013. Good for you. I mean, it's my... <laughs> uh, next question, I think we have time for one more. Hey, um, so in the documentary I saw, like, a mention of ISIS also. I was wondering, like, uh, are the people in Syria, like, sort of caught in between uh, ISIS or terrorists and Assad regime? And uh, is one, like, kind of blaming the other or labeling one siding with the other? Big question, I'll let you guys <laughs> field that one. You know what, it's, I will tell you an interesting thing, when you will see the movie, you will learn that in 2011, President Bashar al-Assad released two groups of criminals. One became later on Shabiha, it's a group that literally were doing kidnappings, killings, all dirty jobs. Similar to what I had in Winter on Fire called Titushki in Ukraine. Similar scenarios. Right now it's official organization. And there another group were heavy radicals, all who were affiliated with Al-Qaeda. And then Al-Qaeda was born in Syria. And then some of them, and you will learn from the movie, became ISIS. So it was interesting how the criminals that were in the prisons of the Assad were before there, and then all of a sudden in 2011 became a free citizens of the country and became all these radical organizations. So you will learn the creation of these organizations in Syria, how they created and how they affiliated to the regime, and that the purpose of that was 
A, to distract the people, not only in Syria, to distract the people of the world. Because Assad did amazing thing. I don't know who suggested him, but I'm sure people can learn from the movie who. So he literally took our attention from himself, from his crimes, into the ISIS. And we were following the ISIS and the world still following the ISIS. So I think even for our president right now to go with the Russia who is cooperating with Assad, completely cooperating with Assad, to go and fight ISIS is not making sense at all because all kind of connected if you will follow the movie. Now they're technically trapped there because ISIS killing them more than killing anybody else. And you will learn it also from the movie. And if I may add something. Well, at the same time when Assad released Al-Qaeda people or the heavy radicals from the prisons, at that time he arrested all the prominent activists in Syria. And all these activists were peaceful activists. They were so much educated and they were the people who aspired for change. Most of them could change a nation if they say yes or no because people were following them in peaceful demonstrations. When they are put in jail, most of them were killed under torture, or we don't know where are they now. Most of them, they just disappeared. These people could change our destiny because they have their say. At the same time, all the radicals are out, and now we are struggling with a few pe people who still believe in the change, that how we could stop the radicals from brainwashing the kids or the young men and women, and how we're going to face Assad at the same time. So we are now waging two wars at the same time, and we are completely exhausted that we can't. Like, we can't I wanted eat. to, sorry, just, I, I wanted to ask you, it's a, it's a broad question, but what has it been like to watch personally the progression of what has happened in Syria in the sense of like, it started as peaceful protests, it turned into a kind of civil war, if you will, where, I mean, Assad was just sort of attacking civilians, and then it got so destabilized, you now have, you know, you have radical factions fighting inside of it, and Assad has turned the war against them, sort of, but against the people, it's become, so complex compared to where it started. What is that? What does that felt like? Like as if me myself is a hundred persons in one in one character. Back to 2011, where we, when we were in the streets peacefully demonstrating, we were full of hope that in no time we're gonna regain the change. We're gonna go back. I mean, we're gonna restore the constitution. We're gonna replace the president, have our own freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And it's not gonna last forever. Like it's a year max. And then it's the same like what happened in Tunisia when the, the president stepped down. So we're gonna f find the change in, in no time. But out of a sudden, it turned against us. It's the shelling, the kidnapping, the killing, and then the civil war, and then the displacement. And at that time, I've never thought about leaving Syria. I was at home, with, surrounded with my family, my friends. Out of a sudden, the regime break into my hometown, August 2012, killed 1,000 people over three nights, and then we have to... Killed 1,000 people in your hometown? How big was your hometown? Like... To an, like 250,000 people. And then we returned back in two weeks because no one wants to leave his home. But we returned back to the destruction. We restored things a little bit. But only two months later, he broke again into the hometown again. And everyone was afraid of the same massacre to be repeated. So we all fled the town. Only 8,000 people stayed because they were at the outskirts. And then they were pushed into the center and they were besieged for four years. And now zero people are there. So if you go back to what, where we started, all the hopes, they just fade. And then you have to brace up and then go with another personality, another mentality, another mindset, and then brace up for the new things you have to face. First, it was Assad, then it was Hezbollah from Lebanon and then Iran and then all the militias from Iraq and then out of a sudden it's ISIS and and who knows then the Russians and then now we are faced with like we're shrinking and the regime is taking over more and more because people are really tired with no one to fight and like millions of people were killed during these five years no one is is left there to fight or to to continue the struggle so 
how I think when I return back to the movie, um, it's like a dream or as if I am in my bed, in my room, at home, having a nightmare. You guys, um, Cries from Syria uh, premieres on HBO Monday, I believe, at, at 10 p.m. It is essential viewing. It's incredible work. If Jenny, did you want to say something? The, that it's actually the sixth anniversary of the revolution. For them, it's the sixth anniversary. And I guess it's, it's a great thing that HBO doing this. And it's not only on HBO. It's also HBO On Demand, HBO Go. So it's everywhere. So everyone can see it alone. And I think there is a lot of appealing things for us, and there is a lot of learning material for us. It is your responsibility as a global citizen to watch this. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You.